Welcome to our program today, Protecting Women's Spaces in the Age of Transgenderism. I am truly honored to be here in the role of moderator. And on behalf of everyone on the panel, I, I offer sincere thanks to the Democracy Fund for its generous sponsorship of this event. Some years ago, a radical gender theory, an outgrowth of what is known as queer theory, which had been simmering for decades in academia, academia came to a boil and overflowed into every facet of Western institutional life. Its advocates reject sex as an objective biological category. Instead, they subsume it into gender identity, a subjective mental perception of one's gender soul. Women have borne the brunt of this theory's impact because, as one feminist scholar put it, woman was not a concern of queer politics and gender displaced any consideration of the fleshly reality of woman's existence. We can pinpoint the date when this theory went main mainstream, November 2006, when a group of trans activists and woke human rights stakeholders repaired to the Indonesian city of Yogyakarta, where they drafted a set of 29 principles. Although not legally binding, the Yogyakarta principles, as they're known, in which, tellingly, there is no mention of the word woman, aimed to furnish a philosophical template uh, for global policymakers in all matters pertaining to gender identity and the legal rights flowing therefrom. They not only succeeded in their mission, I would guess their success transcended their own wildest dreams. Principle three of the 29 was pivotal in establishing the trans women are women meme that infiltrated every nook and cranny of our legal, health, sport, pedagogical, and cultural institutions. Principle three states, no one shall be forced to undergo medical procedures, including sex reassignment surgery, sterilization, or hormonal therapy as a requirement for legal recognition of their gender. In other words, recognition of gender identity in all aspects of life must depend solely on the basis of self-identification. Principle three was adopted wholesale by progressive thought leaders even though anyone with common sense could see the looming collision between gender-based rights and sex-based protections for girls and women. Only one of the conference participants, an English professor of human rights law, ever went public in expressing regret for his having, quote, failed to consider that intact males identifying as women would seek access to spaces conceived for women's safety and modesty. The rise of radical gender theory has caused a stark division in the feminist movement. On one hand are those who accept the transgender rights movement dogma that men who identify as women literally become women when they transition, and on the other hand, those feminists that do not. It's that simple. The former privilege the principle of inclusion over any other consideration. They support policies that treat self-identification alone as proof of a man's passage into womanhood and therefore as a passport into all women's spaces. The latter group support trans rights in all forms of communal life apart from those domains in which the inclusion principle threatens the more important principles of fairness and or safety for girls and women. These feminists are routinely vilified as trans-exclusionary radical feminists or TERFs, a hate-filled term of abuse spat out on social media by radical gender theory militants. One domain after another, education, sport, pediatric medicine, mental health therapy, the natural sciences, crime data collection, amongst others, has been captured by a belief system that brooks no dissent. Radical gender theory is inherently misogynistic on two levels. First, because women must allow men into their private spaces, and second, much worse, 
because they feel bound to pretend they believe the men in their private spaces are women when every fiber of their being recoils from doing so. Women are hectored to honor the subjective perception of males and to treat male feelings with reverence while suppressing trust in their own feelings because they are instructed and have tended to internalize as true the idea that their entirely rational fears and their instinct to demand their right to security and fairness are signs of transphobia. I personally thought that when radical gender theory infiltrated the world of sport, that would be where the rubber hit the road. The love of sport is a universal phenomenon, and so is disgust with unfairness in sport. It came as a great shock to me when even sport associations joined the radical gender theory choir. It was at this point that I had the good fortune to meet Linda Blade, a former elite track and field competitor and PhD in kinesiology, who coaches high performance athletes and serves as president of Athletics Alberta. Her sport association is the only one of all the provincial associations under the umbrella of Athletics Canada, which does not permit males to compete in the girls' and women's divisions. Since publishing our book, Unsporting, How Trans Activism and Science Denial Are Destroying Sport, uh, in April 2021, thanks very much to Rebel Media and Ezra uh, encouraging us to write this book. Uh, I'm sure he was the only publisher in Canada that, that uh, would have published it, <laughs> indeed. Thanks, thanks to this book, Linda has become Canada's public face of justice for girls and women in sport. Lin yes, thank you. I wish she could have been here today, she could not. Linda is a hero to me, and so are today's four courageous panelists. They represent a cross-section of the resistance movement to radical gender theory. All of them have experienced life-altering derailments of one kind or another for the crime of resisting. You will hear their stories, and I'm sure you will be moved to indignation, but as well to inspiration by what you hear. None of them, it should go without saying, but cannot go without saying in the current climate, harbors any hostility to any individual suffering from gender dysphoria who is capable of informed consent and seeks appearance-altering remedies to alleviate their distress. And now, on with our program. Each of our panelists will speak, and then, guided by questions I will put to them, we will have a conversation with each other that amplifies the various themes they have introduced. After that, we will open the floor for questions we have already received from remote attendees, as well as from our in-person audience members. And finally, each panelist will offer a, conclude, a short concluding statement. Our first speaker is Kim Jones. Kim is the mother of an Ivy League swimmer who competed last season against Leah Thomas, a male swimmer whose self-identification as female permitted his entry into the women's division and whose absurdly disproportionate performance finally brought the discussion to a national and international level. As a former Stanford All-American tennis player, a representative of the United States at the World University Games, and the parent of four national level swimmers, Kim has decades of experience in elite sports and the work it takes to get there. After witnessing firsthand the coercion, abuse, humiliation, and abandonment of female swimmers in the Ivy League and NCAA last year, Kim is speaking out about that experience. A passionate defender of the importance of sports, especially its role in the empowerment of women, Kim has co-founded ICONS, the Independent Council on Women's Sport, advocating for fair competition, respect, and fair treatment of female athletes. Kim? Following Kim will be Heather Mason. Heather is a former federal prisoner, and for the past three and a half years, 
She has been advocating for criminalized women on a variety of prison issues, including segregation, strip searching, conditions of confinement during the COVID uh, pandemic, and the issue of prisoners transferring from male prisons to women's prisons. Her advocacy on this latter issue connected her to a group of women who formed a grassroots organization focused on maintaining women's rights to single sex spaces called Canadian Women's Sex-Based Rights Cause Bar. Heather. Howdy. Our third speaker will be Amy Ham. Amy is a Vancouver-based mother, registered nurse, and writer. She is also one of the 10 co-founders of COSBAR, which, as I said, stands for Canadian Women's Sex-Based Rights. Amy started organizing events about gender identity ideology in 2018. For the past two years, trans activists in BC have been trying to get her fired for standing up for women's sex-based rights. The BC College of Nurses is dragging her through a seven-day hearing because of her off-duty conduct, and she could potentially lose her nursing license. She's fighting back with help from the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms. Amy. And our final speaker is Jen Smith. Jen is a 57-year-old transgender activist, writer, and child protection advocate who has opposed the medical and pharmaceutical transitioning of minors and school programs, such as SOGI 123, which stands for Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity, which Jen believes contributes to the problem. Jen led a national campaign to get an inquiry into the impact of transgender ideology on foster children and emotionally vulnerable youth, and in that process became one of the most censored and targeted speakers in Canada prior to COVID-19. In 2019, Jen became the top story in Canada after uh, UBC was blacklisted and ejected from the Vancouver Pride Parade because they hosted his talk on campus a talk that ultimately erupted into chaos, necessitating police and fire, fire department intervention to deal with aggression from Antifa and other protesters. I should note that I use the pronoun his because Jen believes, as he put it to me, in keeping our language straight. Welcome, Jen. Okay, we're all here. I'm now going to uh, turn the microphone over to Kim. Am I on? Yeah. Thank you, Barbara. And thanks to you all for coming today. So you all should be here listening to some amazingly accomplished female athlete inspire you with stories of prowess and possibility. Instead, you have me, and I hope that I can communicate the devastating effects of a single male athlete in women's swimming. The story I have to share is pregnant with pain. It is the mockery and humiliation of women's dreams, work, and accomplishment. It is the erasure of their rewards, their records, personal boundaries, and their status as equals in society. The first dual meets of last season revealed a swimmer in the Ivy League with times that reflected a national champion contender. It took no effort to figure out that it was not a new swimmer. Leah Thomas was formerly Will Thomas, a man who swam for three years on the Penn men's team. It is important to understand that Will was a good swimmer, but not great. The Ivy League is not a top tier conference or one of the Power Five conferences. Will never won an Ivy League conference title. He was never invited to participate at the men's NCAA championship. 
He never qualified for a U.S. Olympic trials, and he was never fast enough, to, despite being a freestyler, to be selected for a relay spot on the Penn men's swim team. When Will changed his name to Leah, took feminizing hormones, and raced against women in the Ivy League, he beat many women in that league who had all of those accolades and more. At the next level, the NCAAs, he walked away with a national championship, beating our female Olympic medalists from Tokyo, women who had represented their countries in international competition many times over and hold national records. Those elite female athletes are far more skilled than Leah Thomas. They are simply working from an entirely different biological constraint, a body formed around a different purpose, and there is no justification for asking them to physically compare their worth to a male. The insult is intrinsic. Along this journey to a national title, Women were constant collateral damage. At the onset of the season, swimmers and parents alike believed that this situation would be remedied by rule makers. Oh, how we misplaced our confidence in people to whom we have given power, and how little we understood what was happening to the young women at Penn. As awareness was growing and mid-season invites got underway, girls began to speak of boycotts, walkouts, and standing on the blocks instead of competing. Then came the media storm. I called the lawyer that I knew at the ACLU to ask how the law, women's rights, and Title IX might be handled in a case like this. I was met with the most stunning response I have ever received on any issue. I was told the words biological and genetic have no business being in a discussion around sex and gender identity. I was told that men who identify as women are women, they are female, they are girls, and no language that minimizes that point should be tolerated. I did not sleep that night. The wool had been stripped from my eyes, and I now understood. That conversation was one of the most pivotal moments I have ever experienced. My education began the next day. I was reading everything I could find. My daughter and the rest of the girls in the Ivy League were getting another kind of education, the kind no one should receive. The Ivy League released a statement in support of Leah Thomas, and mandatory meetings were immediately called. Scripts were read off by coaches from the athletic department, and in some cases, handed out. I have the copies. The girls, already caught off guard and intimidated but upset, were now silenced. They were manipulated, coerced, and emotionally blackmailed. They were told their league and their school had spoken and made their positions clear. They had chosen this position. They were told if they had opinions or if they were asked to speak, they had to clear it first through their coaches and their athletic departments. They were told not to invest themselves in rule changes, but to let the NCAA leaders decide their fate. Finally, they were emotionally blackmailed, told their first priority, above their own fair treatment, needed to be the safety and protection of their trans classmates and competitors. From this point on, every, every voice in the ear of these girls was threatening and silencing. They were abandoned. No one was coming to their defense on campuses, in locker rooms, or in competitions. The sport they had loved and dedicated over a decade and a half of their lives to, that they had sacrificed tears, vacations, sleep, and 5 a.m. workouts to, became nothing more than a chance for them to be silently complicit while a male rewrote their records and relays and took home their most prestigious titles. Never mind, you are only women. So fairness does not matter. Be good, be kind. A little later, I watched my six-foot daughter 
raised this man who dwarfed her in height and breadth. I know what it is like to prepare. Excuse me. I know what it is like to prepare for a competition, but this was like nothing I could have ever imagined. To prepare to lose a race publicly in front of a crowd that will pretend what is happening to you is just. To know you are being photographed and videotaped and the legacy of your years of effort could, the legacy of your years of effort could be any falter, tear, or misstep competing against this male. It was an enormous burden. I watched her valiantly race and play second to a man that didn't appear to try. And then I watched it all unfold again at the Ivy League Championship. I watched mothers crumple over in tears in the stands and fathers decry their daughters reduced to a joke. I know parents that refused to come watch because they couldn't bear it. I saw people cheer with false smiles, only later to confide how awful the whole thing felt. I watched my daughter and her peers used as an example of how women are expected to prioritize a male's feelings over their own achievement. And the abuse did not end there. No woman or girl should ever be faced with male nudity or be forced to undress in front of a male without consent, ever. The thought should make any decent person's blood boil. But now imagine having that consent stripped away just as you prepare for the culmination of decades of work to compete at your best. The girls at Penn faced this every day all year and begged for hope from their coaches and athletic directors. They were referred to counseling. At meets, the girls were faced with the same prospect and when I asked her how she was preparing for the locker room, my own daughter's words were, I'm not sure I have a choice. It was that moment that I realized the extent of the damage and the reach of this message. The coaches and female athletes at the NCAA begged officials to help them and they too were turned away. The women's locker room and the nudity of the girls rightfully due to a man. After the NCAA, I connected with parents and athletes that had spent weeks curled up in tears. Some had chosen not to follow the story, it was too painful. Some had tried to speak up or had written letters. Some had daughters facing male athletes in youth and high school competitions and had nowhere to turn for help. A single male athlete in women's swimming had sent a loud, clear message to every girl, every female athlete, and every woman that we don't matter. At the end of the conversation that I had with the ACLU lawyer, they passed along a suggestion and told me, you can write a letter to the NCAA if you want to protest the rules. I did not respond, but inside I thought, you have judged us wrongly, insinuating that the best we can do is write a letter that can be tossed aside. I knew this was not going to be the extent of our effort. We are not powerless. Now that I see it, now that I know, I will fight tooth and nail alongside other women and men. This will not be the legacy we leave behind. It is not the world that my granddaughters and the next generation of girls will inherit. Thanks, Kim. Heather Mason. So like Farber mentioned, I'm a former federal prisoner and I'm here to talk about our most forgotten about women in society, the women who are locked up with men in cages right now. 
I was in prison when they passed Bill C-16, which allowed males to identify as women and transfer into women's prisons. And I say that allow males because it's a one-sided policy. If I were to identify as a woman, as a man today, I'd be denied transfer due to overriding health and safety concerns because I would be raped in a men's prison. So men can transfer into women's prisons, but women cannot transfer into men's prisons. Um, I was pretty naive when all this happened. I didn't understand what was going on, and frankly, I didn't want to get involved. I stayed silent even when I was sexually harassed, um, and I didn't want to speak out. And that all changed in June 2019. I won a scholarship to uh, the Canadian Association of Elizabeth Fry Society's National Conference in Ottawa. And I went up there with some um, women that were on parole and CAFES, that's uh, the Canadian Association of Elizabeth Fry Societies, they were passing an inclusion policy. And some of us had the opportunity to go up and speak about what the policy and the impacts would be on us. And a woman that I was incarcerated with, she got up on stage in front of all the women who worked for the organization. Um, and she told them about how she was groomed and sexually harassed by a prolific serial pedophile when she was at Grand Valley. And the women in the room dismissed her. There were comments of, you don't need a vagina to be a woman, and I'm concerned about the transphobia in this room. They didn't take her seriously at all, and she left the stage crying. And it just blew my mind. These women are being paid to advocate for federally sentenced women. They're who we turn to when we have issues, and these women were turning their backs on us. The conference opened my eyes. A lot of us were really upset. There was a lot of crying. There was arguments, like straight up arguments in the conference. Um, and a few of us left and didn't even get on stage to get our certificate. And I just, I, I didn't realize how captured the institutions were. I was just like, well, we'll just have to raise awareness. And once people realize what's going on, then they'll just change these policies. Boy, was I wrong. It's been three and a half years of advocating. I've been putting on protests across Canada. We've done 18 protests outside of women's prisons in Ottawa, trying to raise awareness. I've reached out to politicians. Most of them don't even respond, or they send back um, template letters telling me about Bill C-16, as if I didn't already know what it was. They don't seem to care. They don't want to get involved. And it just made me want to fight harder. A lot of my friends inside were sexually harassed and groomed. They're scared, they don't want to speak out. They're told that they're transphobic, that they're bigot, that they're being discriminatory. And they just want to finish their sentence and get out and not cause problems. Some of the issues that we've had in the prisons are rapes, pregnancies. Um, there have been women who, some of you are aware and some of you aren't, but we have a mother-child program. So our children up to the age of four can live with us full time in the prisons. And there's women that have their children in the prisons that are upset about the pedophiles that have transferred in, antagonizing them, looking at their children, stalking the mother-child house, and they can't speak out. If they say anything, they're written up. Um, an instance, there was a prolific serial pedophile who sexually assaulted an indigenous woman at Grand Valley. And when the women found out that it happened, they actually locked the pedophile out of the house. And he went to the guards and told, and the guards came to the house and told the women that if they didn't let him in the house, that they were going to write up in their paperwork that they were bullying him. And it would prevent them from getting parole. And that's the thing. We have to go for parole to get out. So everything that we do or say gets put in our paperwork, and then the parole board sees that. So that prevents us from achieving parole if we get written up too many times or if we get institutional charges. And I think, too, with this debate, most people think that it's, oh, trans people, so, you know, these are men that are on hormones and have had surgery, but that's not the case. You do not need to be on hormones. You do not need to have surgery. Um, you just simply identify as being a woman and you apply for transfer to a woman's prison. So what we're seeing is, is that 50% of the transfer requests 
are from sex offenders, which isn't surprising. Um, and that is, they overrepresent even the males. So in male prisons, only 20% of their federal population are sex offenders, whereas 2% of the women are sex offenders. So 50% is quite a high number. And we have a lot of dangerous offenders as well that are trying to get into women's prisons. We have a lot of people that shouldn't be in there. Women in prison are, you know, they've been subject to so many abuses throughout their lives at the hands of men. And even our female federal population in prison, 50% are Indigenous women. And Indigenous women are impacted the most by these policies because they're also disproportionately overrepresented in maximum security, whereas they're about 49 to 50%. And most of the transfer requests that we're seeing are maximum security prisoners. So they are the ones that are being locked up with these transfer requests. And it just seems like, again, they're just forgotten about. Um, no one seems to care the impacts on these women. And it's just, I keep advocating for this because I want people to know what's going on. Um, we don't want to be locked in cells with these people. We don't want to be their victim. We've been victims throughout our lives enough and it's just adding and compounding to that. And it just, it makes me very angry that this even has to be talked about. That it's just not something that you would be like, okay, yeah, maybe we shouldn't put a sex offender in women's prisons. And with our women's prisons too, um, most people aren't aware, but we live in like cottages. So they're houses. There's no cameras in the houses and the guards don't go through for two hours at a time. And at night, you're, you're there, you're not allowed to leave your house. There are certain times when you're locked down, you're not allowed to leave the house and you have to share all of these, you know, um, bathrooms, laundry, kitchen, everything with them. You can't get away, you can't get away from them. And especially the women in Max, they're in pods, they're in cells, they're locked down. They're not supposed to be double bunking, but it does happen. And there have been women who have been taking out for abortions already. They're giving out the morning after pill at healthcare. They hand out condoms. Um, their women have gotten pregnant. A woman was pregnant um, out in BC and the person who impregnated her beat her up so bad that she miscarried. And it just seems like it's just their they're just trying to hide it. They're trying to hide what is happening um, and you can't count on anyone to release the information to the public. The media wants nothing to do with it, like your CBC, CTV, etc. I'm thankful for the actual news agencies that do post stories about this. But I can't believe that I'm standing here three and a half years later and it feels like I haven't gotten anywhere and then it's just getting progressively worse um, there are legal advocacies, like um, there's a LEAF, which is supposed to advocate for women, the Canadian Bar Association of Canada, the um, Morgan Auger Foundation, and they're all advocating for these transfers to happen. So Corrections has an exemption clause, I mentioned it earlier, where they can deny transfers due to overriding health and safety concerns, which they have denied some transfers. And these organizations think that this exemption clause is discriminatory. They want to see the clause removed. They want to see transfers happen regardless, which just blows my mind that anyone can pretend that this is a good idea. And I just wanted to thank everyone for coming out today and listening and letting us have this conversation. Thanks, Heather. Amy. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really honored to be here, and thank you for making the trek out or for watching online if you're on the live stream. Kim and Heather both did an excellent job of describing the unfairness um, and the horrific abuse that women are facing in Canada um, on the basis of self-ID policies. Uh, my own story is one about mobbing and cancellation. 
So I'll tell my story, and then I just want to mention two principles I believe that we need to champion if we want to win this fight to keep women's faces for women only. Barb kind of told you the, the gist of the story. I've been publicly gender critical for about five years. Trans activists, rather than fighting for their own spaces or fighting against actual discrimination, prefer to use their power at an institutional level to cancel women who dare to question their agenda. They're not sincere. They're fighting to destroy women's rights and child safeguarding practices. Trans activism, as far as I'm concerned, is an anti-social, anti-woman movement that's cleverly been disguised as a grassroots human rights movement. Um, I also just want to mention that I reject our current culture of um, oppression and victimhood. I don't want to paint myself as a victim. I don't think that this is about me. If I wasn't in this predicament that I'm in right now, I think another woman would be in my place. The trans activist movement needs female um, targets to make an example of, and I just so happen to make an easy one for them. So back in uh, 2020, I was involved in erecting a Posey Parker-inspired I Heart JK Rowling billboard in Vancouver. I had already been on the radar of uh, Vancouver's trans activists for organizing public event events about gender ideology and for writing some news and opinion, um, and just generally for having verboten conversations about gender on Twitter. Um, so the billboard set a mob of trans activists after me. I'm assuming that everybody in this room knows why JK Rowling is controversial, and if you don't, it's because she is also critical of gender ideology. So the mob sent threats of violence, um, a couple of them mentioning that I have children, threats of death and rape. Someone shared my photo online and encouraged others to punch me if they saw me in public. Um, and then online I saw people discussing that I'm a registered nurse. So a couple months later, things had settled, I had moved on. Then I received a letter from the BC College of Nurses and Midwives which is the regulatory body that gives me my license to practice my job. No license, no job. So the BCCNM <clears throat> excuse me, said that two members of the public had complained that I could pose a danger to trans or gender diverse patients. And the college was starting an investigation into my off-duty conduct. One complainant is a social worker that I've actually never met or never heard of, but he describes himself online as an activist and a Marxist. The other person remains anonymous to me and my lawyers. To this day, um, the BCCNM is protecting this person's identity because they allege that they are afraid that I would retaliate. So <laughs> to me that they even entertain this person's alleged fear that I could retaliate is an attack on my character and I feel that I have a right to face my accusers. Um, thank you. <laughs> so I've been a nurse for 10 years. I've never had a patient complaint. None of this investigation has had a single thing to do with my workplace. Um, it is 100% about what I do outside of work in my spare time. So I've spent nearly two years um, under a microscope with the looming threat of job loss, ultimately for saying biological sex is real, you cannot change your sex. Well, guess what? Bi biological sex is real, you can't change it, and men can't become women. So I've refused to reach an agreement with the BCCNM um, there, this would have involved a temporary suspension and signing a document saying that I had made transphobic comments. So I refused to do that. I would never do that. I'm not transphobic. None of the people up on this stage are transphobic. Um, and there's nothing wrong with standing up for women's sex-based rights. No one should be punished for doing so. Thank you. So now I have an upcoming seven-day hearing with my lawyers, Lisa Bildy and Karen Bastow, and as Barb mentioned, were funded by the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms. 
Um, so there's a lot. I, I can't say <laughs> about the ongoing proceedings, but we did have a victory recently. Um, the college dropped one of their charges against me, and I'm, <laughs> I'm no longer accused of spreading medically inaccurate information. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, not before they ruined my professional reputation, mind you. Uh, so now I'm simply accused of making derogatory and discriminatory comments about trans people. In other words, I've hurt people's feelings on the internet. Um, I don't care about being nice, and I don't care about the feelings of trans activists. I care about the safety and dignity of women and children, and stopping women's erasure in law, and the male invasion of our spaces. That's it. Um, going back to the principles I mentioned, I don't think we will win in this culture war unless we do two things while we're fighting to keep our spaces. First, we need to be nonpartisan, and second, we need to champion free speech. A lot of Canadians still don't know what's happening under their noses since gender ideology infiltrated our schools, institutions, and governments. Many still don't know that any male can decide to identify as female and immediately gain access to women's sports, prisons and rape shelters, any female space at any time. He doesn't need a wig, he doesn't need to have genital surgery, whatever he says goes. And women better be damn happy about it. Legacy media lies about women like us, if they talk about us at all. Our politicians pretend that we're bigots. Our institutions will happily throw us to the wolves while congratulating themselves on their inclusivity. In Canada, inclusive is code for discriminates against women. Here, we're still building the gender edifice while other countries are they're starting to acknowledge harms and reverse course. But the good news is that women still have sex-based rights protected by the Canadian Charter. So <laughs> let's fight for them before it's too late. Um, I think we've got this. Thank you. Amy Dan Smith. Okay, um, thank you for coming out, everybody. Uh, I think probably I should start by thanking the college. Um, over the years, I've been invited to speak at seven uh, different colleges and universities, and uh, six of them canceled my events and refused to let me uh, speak on uh, campus. Now, I did do a talk at the University of British Columbia, which uh, Barbara Kay mentioned. They allowed me to speak with great reluctance, and of course, that resulted in, a, in, a, in an enormous scandal, just allowing me to speak. Um, so I very much appreciate the, the college being willing to, to host this event. Now, I don't want to start by being too, too trite, but uh, I'm kind of reminded of the old Sesame Street meme here on the stage that one of these things is not like the other. Because um, I am, of course, I'm the only biological male on the stage today. It makes me uh, somewhat uneasy, but I think it's important that, uh, that I be here uh, to speak. Because one of the things that makes me uh, different in the transgender debate is although I very much support transgender rights and the rights for them to be uh, as they want and live as they want and not be discriminated against, um, I'm kind of old school. So I'm into my 50s now and uh, I grew up at a time when being transgender was not widely accepted like it is now and I grew up in a small town uh, and it was strongly uh, um, frowned upon. So I sort of grew up with a, an idea of, um, well, an old-fashioned idea with some people now, which is that uh, a woman is an adult human female. And that was my understanding of the definition of the term woman. And that has become a, a bone of contention uh, in, uh, these days. And um, I think that also leads us to one of the one of the problems that we're having in this whole debate, which is very emotional, as you can see from some of the speakers here today, it's a very emotional uh, subject that people get very upset about. Nobody's experienced that more than me. But a lot of the uh, debate that's going on right now is semantic in nature. 
So it has to do with the language. Our language is being, some would say, violated. It's being changed. Uh, a woman, which used to always refer to an adult human female, is now being used to refer to transgender people who uh, identify as women. And the thing is that this has created uh, a big problem because we have two primary camps who are fighting this out. We have the transgender activists on one side and we've got primarily feminists and I would say people on the religious right on the other side who, um, who subscribe to what is known as a biological essentialist argument, which is that uh, whether you are a woman or not is determined by your biology and that is the primary and most important thing. So that's the essentialist argument. The problem is, is that on the transgender side of the equation, transgender activists um, use the word woman differently. So they um, believe that a big part of being a woman is what is socially uh, expected. So it's the role that you take on as a woman and um, the place that you find in society. And it's uh, arguably very uh, stereotypical in terms of, uh, you know, s subscribing to what society thinks is a woman. But the problem is, is that these two uh, sides of this debate have diabolically opposed definitions of the term woman. And so they're yelling back and forth at each other about this, and neither one is willing to budge on their definition. And so nothing is being achieved because people, um, I mean, they're not speaking the same, the same language. So Voltaire used to say, before getting into a debate uh, or a discussion, that you always start by defining your terms. So it's very important to, to make sure that you agree on the definition of, of words, otherwise communication becomes uh, impossible. Like I say, it's like speaking different languages and stuff. So again, for, from my perspective, a woman is an adult human female. The word transgender is actually under assault right now too because uh, when transgender started getting used, uh, it referred to um, being transgender in the way that I understand it. So I don't think that I am a a woman. I've never thought that I'm a woman. I've never thought that I could be a woman. This is just basically um, uh, the way I express in the world and how I interact with the world, and I do it for all kinds of reasons. But uh, aligning with the original definition of the word um, transgender, transgender refers to patterns of behavior. It's not a biological thing, and that is important, especially when you're talking about things like uh, sports, because the biology differences between men and women are very significant. And they haven't been consulted on this issue, and they need to be consulted. Now, I think um, it, I, what I bring to the stage today is a somewhat different perspective, maybe one that's needed here because I'm kind of more in the middle on this debate. Obviously I express as transgender, so I've got nothing against being transgender, and I'm very sensitive to whenever I perceive that somebody's being uh, like bigoted and hateful towards the transgender community, I will defend my uh, community against uh, that type of behavior. But I've also always subscribed to the basic uh, principles that these women um, subscribe to as well, and I've been doing talks and stuff on this for five or six years now. And so I support that. So um, I think I bring a, a, an interesting middle voice to this uh, uh, conversation. Another thing that, I, that sort of interests me in being here today is because I've, of course, dealt with feminists and uh, what we'll call right-wing groups now for years in this uh, debate. In fact, I probably wouldn't have gained any prominence on this issue if it wasn't uh, from a lot of support from these groups. Um, but one of the things that I think is important to bring into this discussion is what is happening to uh, children, which became one of my uh, primary focuses. And as Barbara mentioned, I led a national uh, campaign to get an inquiry, just an inquiry into what's going on with our kids. Because what we're finding right now is that, uh, and I'll, I'll connect this to women's issues, but what we're finding right now is that it is the most vulnerable children in our society that are identifying as transgender. And there's some very powerful psychology that's going on here. And this fact, I think, should moderate people's behavior towards the transgender community and understanding that a lot of these people um, come from difficult backgrounds and have psychological issues and stuff. The thing is that I myself was a foster child. I went through the foster care system. I went through six uh, different homes. And in that process, I learned what it is to be sort of a lonely 
uh, rejected child with no sense of identity. Uh, being a foster child uh, particularly sort of strips you of any sense of identity. So a lot of foster children, I think, are looking for an, a new identity and a better life, so they're identifying as this. The thing that really triggered me and got me very active on this was when I was listening to a talk by um, uh, Dr. Wallace Wong, who is probably uh, British Columbia's leading gender uh, uh, psychologist who treats transgender uh, uh, dysphoric children and stuff. During the course of his talk, he pointed out uh, a statistic that really alarmed me. He noted that um, of his 1,000 child and teenage patient, patients, 500 of them, almost half of his patients, came from the uh, Ministry of Child and Family uh, Development. So they're foster kids, they're uh, adopted kids, uh, kids otherwise in the care of the, uh, uh, of the uh, government in some way, so like I was when I was a kid. So that number kind of leaped out at me, 500. Uh, that's half of his patients. Now, when I did some crunching of the numbers, what I discovered was that uh, the province of British Columbia had in its care at that time somewhere between uh, six and 7,000 uh, kids. And when you crunch those numbers, what you find is that 7.7% of, of all children in government care in British Columbia are identified as, are identifying as transgender and are under the care of one doctor. 7.7% of the population. Keep in mind that we just did a census here in Canada where it was estimated that one in 300 people in the general population identifies transgender. Wallace Wong is just one doctor. There are lots of doctors. The numbers among uh, these, these kids could be as high as one in 10. That is a startling number that should concern everybody and support uh, my, I thought, fairly humble call for a national uh, inquiry. Now the way that this uh, sort of uh, links in with women's issues is that when I began sort of uh, trying to raise public awareness to what was going on with vulnerable kids, and not just foster kids, but we're talking about kids with autism, uh, kids with all kinds of different sort of psychological issues are the ones most likely to identify as uh, transgender. And when I first got involved in this, I, uh, I got a lot of resistance actually from the women's community uh, in, in the sense that they felt that this really wasn't their, their issue. But I think it's an issue that women need to sort of um, uh, look at more carefully now because, uh, as I said to Megan Murphy, who I was, uh, some, some of you might know who Megan Murphy is, she's the leading uh, feminist uh, speaker on this issue. Um, she didn't want to get involved uh, with the subject that I was pursuing at one point, which was SOGI123, which is going on in our uh, schools right, right now, that um, basically romanticizes being transgender and is leading and contributing to these kids' identity, identifying as a transgender. And keep in mind that most of these kids go on to use Lupron and synthetic hormones. So they're turned into lifelong pharmaceutical uh, um, customers, and um, many of them are sterilized for life. So when I raised this issue, Megan said, this isn't really our issue. We're more concerned about women's spaces and women's sports and stuff. But what I said to her is what I will say to you and what I will say to everybody on the stage here today is that you can achieve whatever you want in this debate in terms of reclaiming women's rights that have been taken from them that should be restored. But unless you pay attention to what's going on in our schools, when all of these kids get done school, and get into the voting pool, they will undo everything that you have tried to do. So if you're not looking at what's going on with our children, you need to. And hopefully we'll be able to <laughs> discuss this today. And I'm gonna leave it right there and we'll get on to discussion, and thank you. Thanks to all our panelists, I think they all uh, did a great job and coming from very different career paths and, and, and life experiences, uh, I think we'd all agree these were powerful stories um, and uh, very moving and also uh, arousing a great deal of indignation. And I learned a few things I didn't know before, so I, I'm better informed than I was. Uh, so now it's time for our group discussion. We've gone a little over time in terms of the timing of this, and I was supposed to ask each panelist two questions each. I'm going to ask one question <laughs> each so that we'll try to uh, not have you, you know, uh, have time for questions from the audience too. 
Uh, Jen, I'm going to start with you because uh, you startled me with those numbers at the end. What you're really saying is that uh, children who do not have advocates, natural advocates, parents, even though there are a lot of parents who are perfectly happy to see their kids go down that path with puberty blockers and everything else, but you, these are very vulnerable children. That's a very high statistic. Tell me how effective you have been in, in um, getting into the early education, the SOGI stuff. Uh, have you had, is, do you have parents supporting you in this? Have you been able to get these, these numbers and these, uh, this, this early education uh, grooming kind of education that they're giving children? Have you ever gotten uh, these things raised at board of trustees or have you been allowed to speak to? Uh, give me a, a little sense of your experience in the arena with, this, with the ed early education. Well, a big part of the uh, the struggle that uh, that I've been sort of uh, involved in now, and I've been in this uh, going on six years back to, since uh, Bill C-16 was first being uh, put forward. So a big part of that struggle for me has been educating people because people just don't know. To this day, that statistic which I just gave you, that it maybe is one as high as one in ten uh, foster children and children in government care are identifying as transgender. This should startle everybody. That is a okay. startling figure. Right, because if one in 300 in the general population identify that way, and one in 10 foster children are identifying that way, there's something going on there. And I know what that is because I was a foster child. I was in the foster care system, and I know that um, one of the things that really takes a beating is you um, feel like uh, you've got no home and you've got no identity and, and you just feel like you don't belong. So of course a lot of these kids are, are looking for a new life and a new identity, especially if they were like me when I was in school. I was bullied and stuff. So um, that really also sort of created this desire for a new life. But in discussing this, um, it was a very long, hard struggle to try to get the, the message through. And like I say, it's, I'm still having trouble uh, getting the message out there. When I led the national inquiry, uh, or the call for a national inquiry, it went pretty well. And we had thousands of verified signatures, and we got it onto the desk of the uh, Minister of Health uh, and into the House of Commons. But unfortunately, the person who was sponsoring me in that uh, uh, um, uh, initiative um, once it got into the House of Commons, he was supposed to read it to the House of Commons, and he actually kind of betrayed us at the last moment and didn't read it and just sort of silently filed it and just sort of ruined everything that I was trying to do. Now, I've spoken to uh, lots of school boards over the years, so some school boards will actually uh, listen uh, begrudgingly to what I have to say. Very few are um, sort of receptive uh, to it, and most... Um, try not to, to discuss the issue at all. Um, far, far more school boards um, uh, refused to let me speak to them, even though I was being sponsored usually by um, like groups of local citizens and stuff to come speak on their behalf because of my sort of profile in this. But the vast majority of uh, school boards would do anything to make sure I could not even speak to them for 10 minutes. Uh, there was just a handful of school boards that actually allowed me to speak, so there's a great deal of resistance in the educational system to this, and that needs to change, but I think we need to be careful, and I say that I'm a defender of my community, right, and I remain and will always remain a defender of my community. I don't want this to turn into hatred. I warned the transgender community five or six years ago, if you don't back off, you're going to create a wave of hatred against us. And we're beginning to see some of that now. So I think we need to find a balance. It's good that some of these issues are finally getting discussed. And we're seeing uh, it become more open now. But we're not where we need to be. Like I say, I believe this issue needs to be part of a national inquiry where we determine how we as a society want to uh, uh, treat this issue. Um, it needs to be widely discussed. And people need to be properly informed. Well, thanks, Jen. I, 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 I think what you're doing is noble and uh, people need to be aware of it. Um, and just finally, uh, how can people support you in, in, your, uh, in your work? 
Well, I'm usually working on one, one thing or another. I'm going to take another push at trying to put pressure on for a national inquiry. People can go to my website, which is uh, jensmith.ca, and uh, stay up to date with what I'm, I'm doing. Um, but the main thing is to, to communicate this issue, I think, to, to friends and family and discuss it uh, in, like, not in a hostile way, because the people that we need to convince mainly are in the middle, right, the great middle. Um, it was one of, uh, I think, Bill Clinton's advisors uh, on campaigning who said, you don't direct your arguments towards your dedicated followers and stuff. You always target for the great middle because that's what you're trying to convince. So we need to be very polite, very thoughtful, very respectful, but very strong in what we do and support people like the people you see on this stage when we are uh, putting forward positive initiatives that are trying to be respectful uh, and need to be heard. Okay, jensmith.ca, please, uh, please learn more on a subject that doesn't sound to me like anybody else has really taken on as, as a full-time kind of thing. So thanks very much for that, um, for briefing us on that. Uh, okay, going back in reverse order, um, Heather, uh, I do know something about your work because I've written about it and uh, I applaud what you're doing and I agree with you that incarcerated uh, people in general and incarcerated women are uh, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, they are the least respected people in society. It's very hard for them to, uh, to I suppose, gain the sympathy um, or the attention of people. But on this particular issue, I, I, I do think the unfairness, the injustice is so great. Uh, and as you put it, women are like in a cage, trapped. Um, you, you're very eloquent in your defense, and uh, I think it's wonderful. I think the work that Causebar is doing, as I'm a big fan, a lot of my friends are at Causebar, yay. So um, that's another, uh, people should look at their website too, Canadian uh, Women for, um, Canadians for Women's Sex, wait. Cana Canadian Women's Sex-Based Rights. Canadian <laughs> Women's Sex-Based Rights. Go to their website. But I want to ask you, uh, uh, Heather, it's not just that, it's not just that the women are that's one serious issue. But there's another issue that doesn't get talked about, and that is crime data collection and how that's affected uh, by this gender identity policy. Tell us about that. Yeah, so like Jen was mentioning, um, he has data. I don't have data. So um, Corrections has like adopted gender diverse language. So for instance, the last time they were contacted, and were asked how many um, trans they have in care, they said they had 24 gender diverse prisoners in women's prisons and 61 in men's prisons. So Barbara, can you tell me how many males are in there? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. So we have no data. I have to make assumptions on that. But so what, about, what about crime data? In other words, are we now in Canada, if, if a woman is assaulted, um, sexually assaulted, is it officially now, if it's by a male who identifies as female, is that, is that crime uh, logged as uh, a woman being attacked by, a, sexually attacked by a woman? Yes, so it is. It's being obscured, right? Like, women's histories and pathways, like, we're absorbing their transgender statistics in with women's. And it's particularly concerning because our federal, um, of federally sentenced women, like the, our population is small, right? So we have approximately 700 women federally incarcerated. Men's are a lot larger. So when we start taking data, men's data, so sexual violence, extreme violence, so for instance, uh, Matthew Harks or Tara DeSouza or Michael Williams or Stephen Melbacher, we start taking their data and saying that they're women, then it changes the profile of the data that we have for women. And we use this data for sentencing, we use this data for intake, for reclassification, for programming. So now we're absorbing all of this male data and it, we're making it as women's. So it's completely changing and creates a false narrative of women's pathways to crime. Um, and you especially see this with dangerous offenders. So we have hundreds of dangerous offenders for males 
and we have like one um, for females. But now if you look, they say they have more because these are actually male dangerous offenders. And the one female dangerous offender that we have is actually my friend, and she's an indigenous woman, and it's because she has poor institutional behavior. It has nothing to do with sexual offending or anything like that. Um, so now it's making women look a lot more violent. So yes, there's a big issue with the data. Okay, that, that is a serious issue too. So uh, thank you for expanding on that. Uh, turn now to Amy. Um, Amy, your profession, yeah. nursing, as well as doctors too, mm -hmm. there's a big impact now on, on people that want to go into the medical profession to help, say, women, uh, work with women or work with children. Um, what impact is this having on the profession as a whole? You're, you're kind of a symbol of somebody who got caught up in the drama of, of someone who takes the absolutely objective, <laughs> obvious attitude that, that biology is biology and, and sex is real. So, uh, you know, there's a real shortage of nurses in Canada. Uh, what's going to happen here? It's concerning, and it's been in the news very recently that we're shutting down emergency departments because we're short-staffed, and that's in addition to, for years, we've seen stories about nurse burnout, um, staffing shortages, and it's it's a profession in crisis for a lot of reasons and then when I think if women or girls are looking to the profession and they also see my case they would be discouraged from wanting to be a nurse you would hope that when um, a culture like ours is kind of being overrun by a particular ideology that the last institutions to fall would be the science-based ones the ones that you think would be immune to this but um, it's not, it's really discouraging, and I think that the BCCNM is doing a disservice to the profession across the country by, um, by having this case go forward. Thanks. I, I, I do worry about the medical profession as a whole when, you know, you start having um, men who identify as women in, in wards with other women. I mean, there's, there's a lot going on. And, and doctors who have to talk to patients in a certain way, I'm told, because, you know, you don't want to hurt people's feelings by saying you're not actually a woman, so I can't examine you, you know, or I can't, can't do a pap smear. Um, but I, I guess that's beyond the bounds of what... Yeah. <laughs> what I, I don't... Um, and from the get-go, my investigation is not related to my job, and I've always kept my politics extremely separate from the job that I do at of work. Of course. Um, so it's definitely, you know, we, we know that it's also happening in healthcare institutions, but that's not somewhere that I go. Oh, well, listen, uh, we all wish you good luck with your case. Uh, Thank it's you. It's an important one, and, and um, you know, kudos to you for sticking it out. Thank you so much. So finally, Kim. Uh, subject very close to my heart, of course, a little biased because uh, that's the one that I sort of latched on to uh, with Linda. Um, we are at a kind of pivotal moment here with sport because we've seen some successes. Uh, FINA was a huge success, and you'll, uh, I'll ask you to just say, t say what that success was. And then I'll ask you, uh, just, just tell, I don't know if any, if, how many people in the audience are familiar with uh, Title IX in the United States? how important that, yes, I'm sure some of you are, but um, the big battle now in the United States uh, is that Title IX was meant to be, to help women to achieve their goals, not just in sport, but in other ways, uh, and it's now being, <clears throat> and it's now under the gun as uh, being interpreted uh, through the lens of gender rather than sex. So um, tell us what you think is going to happen to sport because of these pivotal decisions by rugby and swimming, and then just a word on Title IX. Okay. <laughs> um, so yes, FINA came out with a new decision, um, USA Swimming. Oh, sorry, FINA is the... FINA is the international governing body of sport for water sports. So it covered swimming, diving, and water polo, and FINA said ages 12 and up essentially is sex-based categories. So unfortunately, that decision only applied to international and elite level competition. And the group that I have co-founded, please check it out if you're interested in women's sports, iconswomen.com, 
We believe that sport women and girls deserve access to fair competition at every age. You do not have to be an elite woman, woman to deserve fair competition. So, <laughs> thanks. Um, so we are actively working to try to continue to push FINA and USA Swimming to adopt policy that protects all women and girls that want to participate, whether they are young and learning at the grassroots level or competing in master's level competition. Uh, that was a great ruling because it's a step in the right direction, so we are seeing the progress uh, with the governing bodies of sport waking up to the discrimination that female athletes are facing. Uh, World Rugby has clarified that there should be sex-based categories out of safety and fairness. World Boxing recently also did. Um, we have a couple of uh, British Triathlon adopted a policy for sex-based categories as well recently. There are several others. We're seeing the needle moving in the right direction, but there are several other governing bodies of sport that are coming out and saying self ID. You know, so if my husband woke up tomorrow at six foot eight and said, I would like to participate in women's soccer or women's rowing, I can do that starting that morning. Um, so we have, we have a long ways to go, but we are seeing the needle move in the right direction. Scientists are speaking out. We have the data, we have the science. The question now is just, to ask the governing bodies of sport, do you believe that women deserve access to fair competition or not? It's a yes or no question, it's that simple. Um, the, what we need to do is gain the leverage of the athletes, the people who support sports, and we need people to be um, willing to have a spine and defend women. But, so. but how is, is, is Title IX so Title IX yeah. now? Okay. I, I know, I'm a little obsessed with Title IX because I think that's very pivotal. It's very important. Yeah. So Title IX is the law in the United States that allows uh, the protection of women, it gives women protection from sex-based discrimination in education. That means K through college, um, it was supposed to protect women's rights to not face discrimination in any federally funded education institution. It wasn't enacted um, necessarily to protect sports or to open the doors of sports. It's 50 years old as of this summer. But what it did do, a byproduct of that legislation, was to open the doors of athletic opportunities for women. So what we have seen since Title IX is a wave of opportunity for women in sports and it parlayed into women's success in athletics, but at simultaneously and lagging right behind that was success in visibility for women in business and in politics and just being able to be viewed in society as a champion or an accomplished person. So. Um, the Biden administration used the 50th anniversary of Title IX to rewrite and totally undermine the sex-based rights of women in the United States. They now are equating sex with gender identity, and um, this impacts every aspect, K through college, of any sex segregation um, in a federally funded institution, whether that's locker rooms, uh, scholarships set aside for women, um, classrooms, rape crisis centers on a campus, sports, athletics, um, any sex segregated facility, dorm rooms, if your roommate, uh, you will not have a grounds to complain if you're housed with a male who identifies as a woman. Um, I mean, any communal area that is set aside for the protection or advancement of women. And that absolutely parlays over into sports. So the Biden administration, we think they were being too smart for their own good, said they were going to set aside sports um, and come out with their um, discussion on around athletics after they, they rewrote the rest of Title IX, but they left athletics in the preamble, and we believe what they're expecting to come out with later is more sports at a granular level. So when the governing bodies of sports could override an athletic institution framework, or how you in, how you have to include students in K through 12 versus college. When does the NCAA have precedence? What kind of testosterone regulations would they say go too far? So um, we expect that they are 
we're still in the writing, the comment period, but these are, that's expected to end, gosh, where are we? Like in the 14 days or something like that, very soon. And then this will be law. So there's already an active push from many states to go against this, but it will completely eradicate the doors that opened athletic opportunity for women and, um, you know, birth the opportunity of professional sports and youth athletics in the U.S. Well, can, can, Barbara, can I just in interject on this subject and just quickly, because you said earlier, I think this is important on this subject, is I asked you why you think it's insufficient that, say, the Olympic uh, Committee is, is trying to, you know, create, um, like they're restricting testosterone levels and stuff like that. So why is there no sort of uh, compromise that, that you think could be reached to allow transgender males to participate in women's sports? Because I think what you said on that is very important. Okay, thank you, Jed. Um, yeah, there's absolutely no way to make fair competition between males and females. The paths of development for males and females are divergent from the point of conception. We can talk all day about testosterone levels, but we have different joints, we have different tendons, ligaments, our muscles are structured differently, the shape of our hips, our knees. As a former athlete that has had knee surgery on both knees, you know, the ACL goes through a V-shaped groove in a woman, which acts like a knife when she pivots. And in a male athlete, it goes through an arch. So they do not suffer the same I kinds of- I never knew that. Yep. <laughs> they do not suffer the same kinds of injuries. Um, Male knees and hips, the orientation of them, allow for faster repetitive motion. You can take muscles that out of the equation. And so if you eliminate testosterone, it still can never be fair, just physiologically, the way we're built. When you look at testosterone suppression, there's whole systems of the body that testosterone suppression never impacts, not one iota. The skeletal, the heart, the lung, as I said, the ligaments and tendons. So we're measuring, we have 15 ongoing studies right now. Um, so I believe they're ongoing. They might, some of them might have been completed that have studied testosterone suppression. It does not mitigate strength. And, there are, um, it, and if that's all we're looking at with testosterone suppression is the mitigation of strength. As I said, there's just whole systems of the body that are not accounted for got that new golfer, right? And Caitlyn Jenner recently came out and said, oh, golf is about touch and your ability to move a ball around on the golf course. It's absolutely still about power, a hundred percent about power. But being a tennis player, there are, the men serve differently from women. We rotate differently as I, our backs are built differently, our hips and shoulders, everything is different. It allows you to invite spin, the levers are longer, your well, I, I mean, I, 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 I think Serena, wasn't it Serena Williams? Serena. Serena, who said, you know, she was like the most powerful tennis player of all time for women. Mm -hmm. And she said, if I was on the men's circuit, I would be like 150th or something. It's a different I mean, sport. If yeah, I grew up totally playing different. against men. It's a different sport. You cannot compare male and female athletes. It's, it's, it's ridiculous to be like comparing a male athlete to an ape in powerlifting. I mean, you just do not. I think, I, I agree. This. I agree, and, and by the way, um, although we do not have a Title IX in Canada, we do have, um, uh, in terms of for sport, we have the Canadian Centre for Ethics in Sport. The Canadian Centre for Ethics in Sport was founded after the doping scandals of the 1980s. And it was founded, and the word ethics was put in there, because its primary pur purpose was to ensure that doping did not occur again in sport on anything like, and that it would be wiped out in sport. Uh, in effect, um, men playing in women's sport is a form of doping oh, sure. because their, their, their advantage is something like 13% at least over, and that's even admitted, by the way, that's even admitted by trans activists who say, well, inclusion is more important. That's, th that's their only, that's their answer. And the Canadian Centre for Ethics in Sport, I think you should know, uh, that their guidelines are what um, are what uh, are followed by all high school and university sports in Canada, and they they not only allow for any uh, female identifying male to go into, but without any testosterone suppression, anything. Not only that, but they allow they allow uh, a, a male to identify as a woman for one sport, and then 
the next season identify back into, you know, even in the same, within two sports, you, a person can identify as either. Yeah. So and that just shows you how, how utterly crazy it is. But. Yes, and as soon as you have an obviously known unfair advantage or you're saying doping shouldn't matter or it's just one doper or just one person with an unfair advantage, you undermine the whole premise of sport. The integrity of it is gone. So what was supposed to be an empowering and uplifting involvement, personal involvement, becomes uh, reduced to something that you're participating in as a joke. And we do know that women are, uh, and girls, are dropping out of sport, uh, not only because of this, but because they sense there's just a certain, they, it's by osmosis. They, they are saying to themselves, this isn't worth it. I, 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 I wanted to ask any of you who want to jump in here, um, there were a few lawsuits, uh, it started with sport, the, the Connecticut, those Connecticut girls, the running, you know, uh, they were successful, weren't they? It, no. I thought they were. No, the Biden administration has tossed the case. <gasps> okay. As far as I know, they are, so tossed it through the Department of Ed, but there is some hope that they will, um, they've been trying other avenues and some of those look like they're working out. I need to go get myself updated from Okay, from I, you know, girls, a lot of people. But it did, was not successful. I, I know that a lot of people question and some of the questions that have come in, what can be done, what can be done, and I, you know, people keep saying, well, there have to be lawsuits, like in, 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 uh, uh, in England, uh, the, you know, there was a lawsuit, the Tavistock uh, Clinic recently had to close down because uh, they did a, an objective review of the methods that were being used, the, the total affirmation, and uh, uh, there are a thousand, I think there are a thousand families that are doing a class action suit. And people keep saying, well, you, you've got to sue, you've got to sue. Now, Amy, you're involved. Do you think this lawsuit of yours, is it a, would you call it a lawsuit or would you call, is it going to set a precedent that others could follow that if they win, like, if you win? Mm -hmm. So it's likely that it could set a precedent. Essentially, um, the dis disciplinary hearing is, uh, it's quasi-judicial. However, an appeal could go through the court system. And I... No, and, and my, I know my lawyers are alongside with me that I'm not willing to take any sort of punishment for my views. Um, so I would take it as far as I can take it and hopefully it would result in something useful for other Canadians. And Jen, what about in, in, in education? Like, is there any, have you ever um, approached the, uh, uh, or have any parents uh, is there any way in through the law that they could, you know, um, end these this this these these SOGI courses? Uh, has that ever come up as as an avenue of? Well, for for something like SOGI one two three, for instance, that uh, in fact the the only way to approach that is to go to the school boards. Um, so I encourage people to, to go to school boards and and let them know because they do have the final say on these things. Now they can't violate. Uh, uh, charter rights, for instance, right? But uh, when it comes to, for instance, determining what materials are going to be in schools, that authority rests with the school boards. Now, for the most part, especially on sensitive issues, school boards don't want to decide that issue. They want to pass the, the buck to somebody else and let somebody else deal with it. But there is room for, for uh, going to school boards and getting them and putting pressure on them, again, respectfully, please, uh, to, uh, you know, correct for some of this. Actually, they're having su success with school boards. In the United States, they are. there have been several states in which parents have risen up and pressured the school boards and they've, they've had changes. My impression of the school boards in Canada is that they are now extremely infiltrated with, uh, with activists. This is now a pathway to politics, is to go through school boards and to become school board trustees. Um, and I've got several cases like that, you know, I have in my files and some of them I'm going to write up, but it's now becoming clear to me uh, that becoming a trustee of a school board is uh, a form of activism where it didn't used to be before. And, and I noticed that parents are extremely passive in Canada compared to the U.S. There's a lot going on in the U.S. Uh, with parents uh, 
you know, going to these school board meetings, and they won't, they won't be shut up. They'll, they're, they're really getting quite aggressive about it. Critical race theory and, and radical gender theory, uh, they're, they're doing it there. But I don't get the sense that, you know, it's Canada, right? So uh, people are kind of passive about it. And I'm, I'm waiting for parents to rise up, and I don't see an uprising. I don't see parents. I know that there are organizations like Parents for uh, PAFE, uh, Parents for the Advancement of Fairness in Education. There are groups to join. There's uh, FAIR, uh, the Foundation for, um, oh, I keep forgetting, I'm sorry, uh, Individual Rights, Advancement of Individual Rights for Tolerance, uh, uh, or in Fighting Intolerance. Uh, there are many different organizations along those lines, but I don't see uh, I don't know if you get the sense that there's, amongst parents, amongst ordinary people, that there's people wanting to get involved. Well, I think part of that has to do with the character of Canada, as uh, Jean Chrétien would have said, we are a very tolerant society, right? So we like to, and that's a good thing, it's not necessarily a, a bad thing, I think it's good that we're, we're uh, tolerant, but you know, we can't go to uh, extremes and get into uh, absurdities. Uh, my experience with the school boards, I mean, it, for school boards, you could say the same thing about any branch of politics, that people who have a vested interest will infiltrate it and promote their uh, interests from within. And you see some of this uh, in, in the school boards, and uh, Chilliwack is one of the more notorious school boards where uh, Barry Neufeld um, uh, was oh, yes. protesting against OG123. Um, and they, they, on that school board, they had really just a couple of people who were really loud and really, really pushing it. What I have found, and I've dealt with uh, uh, countless school boards at this point, is the vast majority just don't want to address it at all. Um, like I was saying that the, 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 the decision as to what materials to allow into schools and also what policies as far as uh, bathroom policies and, and stuff like that, uh, these are decisions that are all made by the school boards. And it's in, like in British Columbia specifically, and I believe it's the same in Ontario, uh, the, uh, the School Act stipulates quite clearly that these decisions are to be made by the school board. But when you go to the school board, like I have gone to the school board, they say, this isn't our jurisdiction. This is decided by the province. We, we don't, you go talk to the province, don't talk to us, and they shut you down. The problem is, is when you go to the province, the province says, no, no, it's right here in the BC School Act. It's their responsibility. So they keep passing it back and forth. And about the only thing you do is just keep on uh, working at it and trying to raise awareness and get more and more people because the thing that is resulting in, in change in the United States is um, the numbers of people who are sort of causing trouble in school boards. Again, I'm not a big fan of causing uh, a scene because I've been at the wrong end of, of, of that type of uh, sort of protest and stuff. But you certainly need the numbers to put pressure on the school boards, and you got to stick to it. I've been in this for six years. Anything that you want to try to achieve uh, in terms of legislation and stuff, you got to sort of prepare yourself to be in it for the long haul and really apply yourself, stay with it, and keep recruiting people. And the more people you can get into a school board meeting, uh, the I more likely that? you're going to change things. Maybe you got to do seminars for, you know, train people how to do it. <laughs> well, I mean, like I toured. Uh, countless cities trying just to yeah. raise awareness and, and put information out there as to what's yeah. going on. That's important and I think that's sort of the role of us here on the stage is to get out there and get people educated on the subject and tell people why they need to care. So when I'm talking about what's happening with, uh, uh, with kids, I come at them with startling statistics like what's happening with the uh, foster kids. People don't know this, but when you tell people, everybody gets it. So the battle, the primary battle we have is being able to communicate. That's why this panel discussion here actually is, is so very good because it's, it's so hard to get the message out there. Okay, you said you Can said I speak important. to that as um, having young children? So it's difficult. There's a culture of fear about parents even wanting to speak up and say that they're worried about this being taught in schools. I know other progressive parents that have their secular and progressive, and they've considered going to religious schools to avoid SOGI entirely. Um, at the same time, I know if you're in kind of online um, communities of other parents, the activists that are pushing it 
run all of these groups, so there is no room to have a discussion. And in terms of kind of what my own plan to do is to speak to teachers one-on-one -on -one about the curriculum and how they plan to teach it and whether or not I can remove my children from the classroom while it's happening. But I think an issue with that, from what I'm hearing, is that it's not that they set aside time to teach SOGI. The intent behind SOGI is that it's immersed in the entire, uh, the entire curriculum is immersed in the principles of SOGI so that you can't really, it's not like the sex education from grade five when we were growing up where it was an hour um, every Thursday and you could leave. SOGI is throughout the entire curriculum. Yeah, so they it's very say, concerning. Yeah, they say every grade, every class from K through 12 should address SOGI at some point in some way. Well, okay, you said something about getting, you said got to get the message out, but it's hard. Uh, in terms of getting the message out, I'd like to ask, uh, what maybe you could give us some sense of what your experience with media has been um, whether is it is it they 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 ignore you they don't ignore you but they only give you negative where have you found pe positive where have you found negative Heather have you had any what's your experience with media because I know that that uh, getting the media to be interested in writing about conditions for women in prison is probably not uh, the easiest pitch so I contacted pretty much like every news organ organization when I first started advocating like and I had some journalists contact me they would talk to me on the phone interview me and then there would never be a story um, or some of them would get back to me and be like my editor won't let me print it um, and now I just don't even hear from the CBC CTV um, any of them um, like I definitely have rebel news at my protests and of course you um, but those other mainstream medias just won't even bite on it. I remember, so when I was protesting in Abbotsford, BC last summer, like we, a cause bar would send out news releases. So we notified all the media ahead of time about the protests and CBC went and interviewed um, Morgan Auger. <laughs> Instead of- tell, tell the audience uh, and, and for those who are gonna see the video later who Morgan Auger is. So Morgan is transgender, um, lives out in BC, big um, activist, has a Morgan Auger um, foundation, and is definitely the one pushing all the prison policies and practices. Um, was the one that helped um, men get into women's prisons. Also lobbied the city of Vancouver and to defund Vancouver Rape Relief. Yeah, the Rape, r rape yep. Crisis yeah. Center. And has referred to female inmates as vermin. Yeah, not a nice guy. Yeah, well, that's that's the problem is they go to the wrong people, right? So when, when, when for instance, the, probably the best illustration of the problem with, with the media is what happened with UBC. So UBC was kicked out of the Vancouver... Uh, Sorry, University of British Columbia. I University of British Columbia. They were kicked out of the Vancouver Pride Parade in 2019 for the sin of allowing me to speak on campus. But the thing is, is this triggered a national discussion and a debate about this issue and hundreds of uh, newspapers and radio stations and television stations all across Canada were talking about this issue but it was like they talked around it and of all the hundreds of stories and hundreds of reporters who were talking about this issue how many actually contacted me who was in the center of the discussion to ask me what was going on and what my views were zero not one came to me Hundreds of journalists talking about this. Nobody thought to come talk to the person who was in the center of the debate. That's so telling. What about in the States, Kim? Media, at least in the States, you know, here we have Rebel, we have True North, we have a few, you know, non, they're non-mainstream, but they're, they're getting strong, like they have a lot of hits and all that sort of thing, but, but most ordinary people that just watch ordinary news, they're not, they're not gonna tune into Rebel, but in the States, you know, people are very aware of Fox News. Like, there's, there's, uh, there's such a strong conservative voice. So, do you find that was? Tell me about the coverage for this event. <laughs> and well, interestingly enough, I mean, I the conservative news is very willing to talk to us. Is very willing to cover the stories and to listen to female athletes and um, to be 
respectful in, in their printing of what we say, so don't, you don't feel misrepresented. I have spoken, as like you, Heather, um, to the New York Times and um, to several mainstream media or left-leaning media outlets. And again, our editor, love your story, oh my gosh, I can't believe this, but I, I, I won't get past the editor. Or they will, in general, like NBC News, um, ESPN, they will allow trans-identified or part of the, the gender community to author the article. So if there's an issue that comes up and it's controversial, you're not going to hear from the women who are being impacted. So that's, that was the experience during the Leah Thomas um, situation, although I think the amount of media coverage and the interest from the public has started to mandate more of an open dialogue, which I'm really excited about because, as I think anyone here would agree, the fair treatment and respect of women cannot be a partisan issue. It cannot, no. That's a, that's a big change that what she's pointing out there. People should understand that um, if you, even if you go back two or three years ago, I could not even get conservative media to pay attention to what was going on. I had Post Media, who is probably the leading conservative uh, media outlet in Canada, they wouldn't even allow me to take out ads in their papers advertising my lectures, let alone cover what was going on. But we're seeing that change now, so there is sort of headway being made, so I think that's a positive sign, but I think we need to get the left side of the spectrum involved in this debate. And I would say to anybody who is left-leaning, you need to get get involved and you need to start listening to the arguments that you're hearing on the stage today because if you don't get involved and look for sensible solutions, other people are going to decide for you. Well, on that note, thank you, Jen. <laughs> on that note, let's turn to questions that we have received from uh, our remote uh, listeners. Um, there's one that's, I think, I, I guess I should go to the one uh, that is the most difficult uh, to answer, but we'll have to give it a shot. Um, this, this, uh, this person asks, to most effectively combat the transgenderism assault on women's rights, it would help to understand the root causes of political transgenderism. Not the reasons some people are trans, but rather the reasons that the issue of trans right has been blown up into this massive, emotionally charged issue for progressive, non-trans activists. What are your thoughts on the root causes? Is this, if you don't want to answer, you don't have to, I'm just, but I'd love to. Uh... I think you got into it quite well in your opening statement, and it's such, um, it's really an enormous topic to dive into. It could take up an entire hour, and there are so many aspects, including you know, the gender studies and postmodern and critical theory having leaked out of academia and now into our culture and our institutions as people graduate from these places, they bring what they learned with them. Um, and then there's the pharmaceutical aspect where big pharma is making a lot of money on clinics that are now making lifelong medical patients. Um, there are billionaire families that are funding um, this movement and wanting it to appear as grassroots, but it's actually, there's quite a big lobby and there's a lot of money behind it. Um, I think there, there are so many different reasons. Um, and then even if you're looking at young teenage girls who are experiencing rapid onset gender dysphoria, it's, um, it's a misogynistic culture and they're trying to escape being female. Um, it's really not a simple answer. <laughs> Money. So you're talking about pharmaceuticals there. So that is a big part of it. And it's a taboo subject talking about the pharmaceutical industry. So when I did get my uh, call for a national inquiry to be briefly covered by some of the media in Canada, uh, our call for a national inquiry and my wording for that was that we were concerned with the pharmaceutical and medical transitioning of minors uh, with an emphasis on the pharmaceutical aspect because the pharmaceutical industry is making a ton of cash. Uh, some uh, transgender people are spending $400 a month on their medications that they have to keep on taking for life. So there's a lot of money out there. But when my uh, um, call for an inquiry got to the media, 
even though I was calling for an investigation into what's going on with the pharmaceutical industry and uh, essentially drugging our kids, the media changed the headline and said that uh, I was concerned with um, surgical interventions on minors, which is almost not happening at all in Canada. There are some uh, examples, but it doesn't happen very often. So my primary concern was pharmaceutical, and uh, that was right in the text of it, but the media changed it and didn't want us, the, the, the audience to, uh, or the, uh, you know, the readers or, or whoever to look at the, the pharmaceutical aspect, and they made it all about um, surgery, so they're changing it. And I talked to the editor of, um, an editor at CBC, because they had published a headline uh, talking about surgical interventions, and I said, I never mentioned surgical interventions in my call for an inquiry. I mentioned pharmaceutical, so you need to correct that and say what I was really concerned about, and they refused. Well, I, I do think the pharmaceutical industries have hopped onto the bandwagon. I don't think that was the root cause. The root cause is ideological. Uh, and, and actually, I thought a lot about it myself, about the root causes, and I, I do think it goes back to feminism. It, it, to me, feminism got a certain ball rolling, and then it got out of control, and it, it turned around. You know, they say all revolutions eat their children, and I think this is an outgrowth of the feminist movement that was unpredicted, because what the feminist movement told us 50 years ago was, uh, yes, women are essentially, I mean, they, they never doubted the biological essentialism of men and women, but they did say, they brought the whole idea of gender up. We never had this idea of gender until the feminists brought it up, and they said, uh, we all, we are all, our, our, our bodies are what they have always been, but our genders are socially constructed. And they opened the door by saying, uh, there's nothing essential about how we have to act in the world and that men and women are, can be indistinguishable in terms of their interests and their, their, their character traits and their personalities and everything else. The fact that we think women are more nurturing or the fact that we think women want children in a home and all of this, that's social construction. It's not social construction. It is, it is biologically determined that, that women, I mean, I believe, that women have this wish for children and a wish for a home and a wish for a committed relationship. But they said, no, 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 men and women are, are equally, uh, they, they sh their, 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 their sexual lives would be indistinguishable if women were not constrained by the idea that they should be more modest or they should be more selective or they should not have sex before marriage or whatever it was. Anyways, this, this, I don't think they saw where this would lead. And I think that's what led to the idea of, well, if, if people are only socially constructed into their genders, then what about sex? Maybe that's also socially constructed too. Uh, it, it sort of got out of control, I think, and it led to uh, this whole idea of gender fluidity um, and that if you want to change your gender, why shouldn't you? Uh, I don't, it's not that simplistic. It, it, it has a lot to do with postmodernism and theories that have been prevalent in the academia for, for decades that I'm not competent to, to explore here. But I, that was my impression, was that it was feminism that got the ball rolling and it got out of control. And now it's feminists, uh, or it's women, that are suffering the blowback. Okay, can I just make a quick comment on that? Sure. Though? Because, um, so you're saying that you don't think it was primarily the pharmaceutical industry. No, I think they jumped on that bandwagon pretty fast. I, I don't know. Oh, like, you think I think they there's a whole it? series of different factors that are at work here. But the, uh, the perfect illustration, I think, of what's going on is that, again, I've been doing this for six years. And when I first began doing public talks, I was focused mainly on some of the things like the unfairness of what was going on in sports or, or men being put in, in women's prisons and all of this stuff. And initially, I got a little pushback. Right? But I didn't get a lot of pushback. When pushback against me really exploded, when we started seeing hundreds of people show up at my events and protesting and causing chaos, 
That happened at the exact same time that I came out and made the pharmaceutical industry one of the central focuses of my talks. And I exposed corruption in the pharmaceutical industry, and I pointed the finger at them. And when I did that, the moment I did that, all hell broke loose. That's so interesting. Uh, so you actually think that the pharmaceutical industry was causal, not sort of contingent, but that they didn't see an opportunity and jumped on it, that they actually uh, were, were involved in, in uh, creating, in, in, in creating the, the whole movement. Well, I think, that, again, I think there's all kinds of things going on. So, like, when I began identifying as transgender when I was young, there were all kinds of psychological factors going on there, being a foster child, no identity, and that sort of thing. So I think there are a lot of things, but I think what is driving it primarily today, in my opinion, based on my research, and I have documentation <laughs> that doesn't look good for the pharmaceutical industry, they have been fueling it, and it would not surprise me if they are funding a lot of these activists behind the scenes. Again, I did not see the gates of hell open until I began questioning Big Pharma. Okay. I can say one thing short. Yeah, please. <laughs> I think the root cause is human complacency and our unwillingness and fear of calling out things that are preposterous. Well. I, I, I mean, you're certainly right that there's a great deal of preposterous nonsense being um, being assented to and affirmed um, but is the complacency it, it's it's I guess we're it's a chicken it, and we're egg we're letting kind of thing. it happen we're letting it oh we're certainly letting it happen yeah. I guess the, the question is why are people saying these preposterous things? fear no no, no, no. no. Why, why are they why saying are the, the preposterous things yeah, why, 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 how could these preposterous I ideas think get into people's can, heads in the first place? We can be as wild as, <laughs> I mean, I don't think there's any limits to, to we, human stupidity. To human stupidity. All right, we'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> there's one other question before we open it, oops, to people from the floor. There's one other really excellent question. Oh dear. Uh, thank you, I'm so disorganized. Um, and that is, uh, a question about the idea of you've all heard um, you've all heard people parents say I was told that if I didn't allow my child to transition uh, they would commit suicide because suicide is considered to be one of the um, uh, you know because this is such a strong need for a child to be <clears throat> affirmed that if you don't affirm them unconditionally, that you're, you're, you're putting the child at a greater risk for suicide ideation and um, uh, at possible attempts. And we do know that the, the rates of suicide attempts uh, are, are elevated amongst uh, children with gender dysphoria or children who present as uh, needing gender therapy. Um, so that was a question somebody asked and what do you do about that? And I think it's very important that this, this, this is a bullying technique um, and it's fear-mongering uh, to get parents to shut up uh, when, they wanna, when they feel they, they want to protest and they don't want to put the child on puberty blockers and stuff. I think it's important to know that there have been no random controlled trials on these puberty blockers. Uh, the studies that have been done do show elevated uh, suicide ideation, but they are no higher amongst children who present as gender dysphoric than they are amongst children who present, who come to clinics for, to be treated for anxiety, depression, or autism. In other words, mo there is a very high number of children who present as gender dysphoric who also suffer from comorbidities like anxiety, depression, and autism, and therefore, uh, there's no, there's no, you can't know if the suicide ideation is because they're not being permitted to uh, transition or to have puberty blockers, or whether these are children who are so anxious and depressed anyways. There was one study recently that was debunked and I just would like to quote from it. I think it's very important that parents 
should not be guilted into thinking their child is going to commit suicide if they don't immediately affirm um, the child's uh, uh, desire to transition. And uh, the short version, or the claim of, there was a study that came out that got a lot of attention because the claim was uh, that transgender and non-binary youth who received gender-affirming care uh, of any sort experienced a 60% decrease, decrease in baseline depression and a 73% reduction in baseline suicidality over the course of 12 months. That was the claim of the study. But somebody who is very skilled in research analysis, uh, Jesse Single, uh, S-I-N-G-A-L, phenomenal researcher who's devoted himself uh, a lot of his time to this topic. And he looked into the study and using their own methodology and their own data, he, he realized that they were presenting a wrong conclusion. And his, and his um, conclusion was, what's surprising in light of all these quotes is that the kids who took puberty blockers or home hormones experienced no statistically significant mental health improvement during the study. That's using their own data. The claim that they did improve, which was presented to the public in the study itself, in publicity materials, and on social media by one of the authors, is false. Uh, he, he looked at all the numbers and he said, uh, 30, um, 59% of the treatment naive kids experienced moderate to severe depression, 12 months later, 56% of the kids on um, uh, modifying drugs ex experienced moderate to severe depression. At baseline, 45% of the treatment naive kids experienced self-harm or suicidal thoughts. 12 months later, 37% of the kids on, I think GAM stands for, I think it's a medication. These are not meaningful differences. Here's the bottom line. The kids in the study arrived with what appeared to be alarmingly high rates of mental health problems, many of them went on blockers or hormones, and they exited the study with what appeared to be alarmingly high rates of mental health problems. So I think it's very important uh, that we not get too worked up about this idea. Uh, uh, the Tavistock Clinic had 15,000 15, patients. Out of their 15,000 patients, four committed suicide. That is not a statistic that you can take I to the bank and say that if a child has gender dysphoria or presents as being gender confused, that any clinician or any therapist has any right to tell any parent that the risk is high, uh, that this child will, will commit suicide. So that's something I feel is very important. Okay, um, that's not funny. <laughs> Sorry, what? Don't worry. She wants to hear yeah, yeah. No, no, go ahead. I, 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 no, I, I, I actually had looked into it and had these statistics with me. Uh, of course, we can hear from everybody. If anybody want to, yes, go. Sure, just uh, the, um, the study with the four suicides at Tavistock. I'm not sure if they finally got the data for one, but when I was looking at it, one was a question as to whether or not it was, um, which would also reduce the rate even further than mainstream media had been reporting. Um, and that uh, in January of this year, when this study came out, it's the largest one that's been done to date. It kind of compares the rates of suicide amongst children presenting to the gender clinic with um, the general population. So basically, it's a, poor, it's a poorly designed study because the best way to find a true rate would be to compare children who have mental health problems and present to the same hospital for mental health problems with the children who present for gender dysphoria. Um, but regardless of what each particular study says, I think the main and most important point is that the way media reports on it, as you said, it's, it's emotional blackmail and it's a manipulation, it's wrong, and it is harming children to pretend that, to tell a parent that their child will commit suicide when they almost certainly will not, and then use that to get them on life-altering 
um, medical treatment is very unethical. Well, you should, t you should talk about you, what you were saying when we were in our Uber ride there about uh, what Wallace Wong has done, because that's an important point on this issue, on this oh, question. Oh, that's that doctor who treats everybody. That's the one you, you were mentioning before, the, doc the, the name you just mentioned. Walt, did you say? Well, it's, it's Wallace Wong, Dr. Wallace Wong. So that, right, that is, is that the doctor that treats, that has been treating all these children? Yeah, he's yeah. probably the leading gender specialist yeah. who deals with children in British Columbia. And I know that Amy has, has addressed this, that he was recorded in, a, in, a, in one of his talks as, as saying to transgender youths that if you're having problems getting Lupron or these synthetic hormones, the best way to um, uh, grease the gears, if you will, or get, have things go your way is to threaten suicide. He didn't say that outright, but he clearly hinted at that. And the thing is that that is, so I'm very familiar with the transgender community. I've talked to so many of them. This is, as Amy points out there, it is used legitimately as, as an emotional blackmail tool to get their way. Not all of them. I don't want to sort of diminish that. And we need to be very careful when we're talking about suicide. We just had a, a transgender youth in, in Texas who was cut off... Uh, uh, their medications who committed suicide um, because they were cut off. So we need to be very careful, but it is true, as Amy said, that it is used as a, as a uh, tool to get what they want, but not like all the time, so. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that there's, I mean, I don't know too many women that haven't gone through relationships where a man hasn't threatened something or another to get their way. I certainly remember in high school dealing with boys telling me they were going to commit suicide if I broke up with them. So I think that the use of the suicide threat to, especially, I mean, as related to sports, I've heard it now on a couple of calls with various governing bodies that, with the suicide threat, but the suicide issue, and I, 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 Absolutely, I have a close connection with suicide issues in my family, and I think you, as Jen said, you cannot treat this issue lightly. But women, parents, members of society, or social groups cannot be um, compelled to change proper behavior or to treat cross-sections of society fairly and honestly by threat. And it, that it has to stop. It, su <laughs> Thank you. Suicide and the risk of suicide needs to be addressed by, between the individual and their caregiver. We should have policies that protect all humanity from you know, suffering terrible things, but we can't use women as shields or emotionally blackmail them into giving away their rights on the basis of suicide. Well Very well said. Um, okay, um, I think there were, there were, questions? well there were, no there were, there were more questions sent in, but um, I chose the ones that I thought uh, were the most complex, some of the questions had to do with what should we do about bathrooms and, and, you know, locker rooms and um, we can, we can deal with those too. Uh, question for Heather. <laughs> can I jump in? Is sure. that okay? Sure. I want to know, so you mentioned cottages, but my, I don't, I've not been in a prison environment, and I'm wondering how they deal. I mean, is it, are there communal facilities for these kind of same issues that we saw, you know, for sports? I don't know. <laughs> so it's all different. Like, we have provincial jails, uh, which is uh, less, like, two years less a day, and then we have federal, which is two years or more. Um, provincial jails are usually like maximum security, so there are cells, ranges, and it's communal. And then federal, it's like multi-security levels, so you'll have like minimum, medium, and maximum. Maximum security is very similar to provincial. Again, a lot of it is communal. Um, but with our, we only have six women's prisons in Canada, and they're fairly new. 
So originally we only had one women's prison, which was in Kingston, and then in the 90s they started opening up these regional prisons. So for the most part, um, they're not communal. So like, um, I was on medium compound, but I was a minimum security, and I lived in the cottages. So in each house there would be like nine bedrooms, um, two bathrooms, kitchen, living room, dining room, laundry room. Um, so you could shut the door, but like I said, in provincial, there's no door to close. So you, you typically are, you're sharing. Um, and same with, so a provincially, we're locked down a lot, like a lot. We're in our cells, like more than we're out of our cells. And our cells are like, I don't know, six by seven feet. And they're usually putting three of us in there. Um, you have like your bunks and then you have one person who sleeps um, on the floor. So basically from your waist up is sticking out of under the bed and your waist under is under the bed. And the toilet's right there beside your head. Um, so there's absolutely no privacy. Like if you're on your period, you're changing your tampon right there with that person's head right there. Oh. Um, so gross. It's, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's very gross. There's no privacy, no dignity, no anything. Um, so yes, it really depends on where you're incarcerated um, and what security level that you are. Something that comes up frequently when I talk about this with someone who was pushing back or um, is unsure if they, how strongly they feel about the need for women to have sex-based categories or sex-based spaces, they'll say, well, wouldn't it just be nice if we had all individual um, bathrooms, right? Well, so I then have to describe what it's like at a swimming competition where you have 50 to 100 bodies changing in and out of swimsuits that take 20 to 30 minutes to put on. They are that tight and you need help to put them on in many cases. Really? Mm -hmm. So you have a sea of people and there is no way to accommodate that individually. So, and then um, yeah, I think that there's, I mean, we think, oh, wouldn't it be nice if everyone had their own space to go to the bathroom and to change and oh, that would solve all of our problems. And then I also respond with that, that is a problem that has to be solved monetarily and will not be solved monetarily in many cross sections of the US or for me in the US, but across the world. So communal swimming pools or communal recreation centers or places where girls will go to have access to learn how to play sport or to be active to just receive the health benefits, they are going to need privacy and dignity in particular at the ages of nine through 15, 16, but I mean, even beyond that, then starting very young, women's bodies are changing much earlier than young men's are. So to, we're going to self-exclude, women are going to self-exclude from society, from these activities, and I mean, the prison, I mean, it's this, I guess I was trying to draw a parallel. There is no way to solve that without giving women sex-based And it's space not just, spaces. by the way, it's not just locker rooms. Uh, they, ha they are allowed to go, like when, they, when kids go on tournaments, these are also young kids, yeah. 12, 13. They're playing tournaments all the time. Uh, my, my, uh, I have a granddaughter who's a very serious hockey player. They're constantly out of town. And they are forced to, if, if they have a member of the, so they, they have to share a hotel room. Current um, policies for many governing bodies of sports allow for at, all the way through any ages to be housed. And when you're on training trips for US national teams or zone teams, junior teams, you can be housed in a hotel according to your gender identity. There is, I, I've spoken with young families of girls who perceive this as an imminent threat because there is a male on their team who is identifying as a woman teenage girls um, and who have no choice but if they go on these training trips if they get placed with that person will quit their sport well I've had I mean Linda has told me that parents in Alberta have told her if their daughters have to spend you know be in hotel rooms with boys and that they will withdraw their daughters from yes, the sport it's so just, absolutely and it's understandable. women and girls always lose when this happens that's you know, it's the <laughs> male's benefit and women and girls end up losing. 
Um, I think just the, the, the prison issue, that I think that, and you would probably be best to answer this, so I saw a prison in the States, I think it was Idaho or somewhere, but what they had done is they had taken a section of the men's prison and they designated it for transgender women, and I think that that seemed like a sensible solution to me. Is that something that you've looked at? So yeah, I always mention that, but it's not about safety for them, it's about validation. And if you give them their own area or their own section, you're not validating their gender identity. So there are um, some jails across Canada who, that have wings that are specific for trans prisoners, but that's not good enough for them. Um, because it would make sense to have transgender wings which are tailored to their unique needs, which are different needs than women's needs. Um, but that, that just doesn't seem like something that it, they want to do. And like, I would never advocate to create prisons because people are like, oh, make their own prisons. Well, no, because if you build more prisons, they find more people to fill them. And I don't want to see more people being put inside. But there are, there is space on men's prisons and jails, like wings, pods, ranges, where they could develop transgender wings. And that would solve the issue of like accommodating them in the women's prisons. Because on top of that, like I mentioned, there's six women's prisons across Canada. They're a lot smaller. Um, we start taking all these males, then we don't have enough room for our women. So then where do we put our women? Then they're going to start building more women's prisons. Yeah. So. Uh, but, uh, but what you said was very true. It's the validation that they want. So if you, if you segregate, then you're basically saying, well, you're not women, but you don't want to be with the men. Uh, it's the same in sport. You know, people say, well, why don't, why don't, why don't the uh, transgender women just have um, their own league. First, there's not enough, but that's, but the, but the main reason is uh, that they wouldn't want it because they would be saying, no, no, then you're saying we're not women. We're saying, yeah, that's right. So that, the, the whole point is. Um, Sport isn't meant, I mean, in, in any, many of these situations, we're not meant to be, they're not prisons were not created to affirm someone's gender identity. Sport was not created to affirm someone's gender identity. Bathrooms were not created to affirm someone's gender identity. What we are do, we can, you know, take someone as they are and love and support them without um, partaking in every aspect of their No, what personal... you say is it, it's so true because now prisons sport, uh, bathrooms, these are all like therapy centers. They're sure. <laughs> well, and I want to say, I want to be very clear, and I hope this message gets out, sport is for everyone. Yes. I course. do not believe, I mean, I believe sports can be wonderful, but it does not give everyone, sports does not guarantee everyone the chance to compete in the category they see fit for themselves. Exactly. I am not allowed to compete with juniors and I am not allowed to compete in para events. And that's my eligibility, is to compete in a women's category. Now I qualify for age categories, obviously with Terrific. masters. But eligibility is how we determine where a person fits safely and fairly into an event in sports. And it should be the same in prison, it should be the same in bathrooms. <laughs>